Join our guests for insights on issues impacting local government and the citizens of Pennsylvania. Created by the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs, Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs connects you to legislation and policy that will affect you and your family. Your host, Chris Kapp, and his guests discuss current affairs that matter to you most. Connect with your state by tuning into Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs on Sundays here on PCN. My guest today is Senator Pat Stefano. He's a Republican who represents Fayette, Somerset, and West Midland counties. Senator, before we get into the particulars of your bill, can you give us a little bit of background about what's happening to Pennsylvania's bars and restaurants at the moment? Well, as you recall, during this whole COVID crisis, we've had reductions in all kinds of businesses across Pennsylvania. But then on July 15th, the governor said, we believe that the increase in cases is coming from bars and restaurants, so we're going to restrict all uh, activity to 25% of capacity. And that has been a ripple effect all across Pennsylvania. And it's statewide. It's a one-size-fits-all. On top of that, they eliminated all bar service. And that means uh, if you do have a bar beverage, you have to have food with it seated at a table, not the bar. So obviously, that detracts from the business for bars themselves. So what are you hearing from your constituents who are facing this problem? Oh, you can just imagine. Think of uh, yourself as building a business plan, going to your finance companies to help you start your business. What business plan ever envisions a 25% capacity? None. There is no way. Most businesses don't see a profit until the, uh, the 11th hour at 59 minutes. So you're gonna cut a business back to one quarter of what they can do. There is no way to make any money. In fact, talking to one of my constituents just this morning, his issue is how do you keep food fresh? You're not moving it fast enough. At 25%, you can't, your minimum order is too large. So it, not only are you losing money, you can't keep product and you can't keep your staff. So considering these obstacles, you've introduced this slate of bills. Um, I don't want to get into the particulars of each one. Uh, your first one uh, would eliminate the 25% rule uh, that the governor has mandated for restaurants. Can you go into the, the little details of what's happening there? Absolutely. First of all, I want to mention these bills are based on the recommendations that came from the Pennsylvania Restaurant Lodging Association and the Tavern Association. We've been working with these statewide uh, organizations to help build this, uh, what I consider a, uh, a breath of uh, fresh air for our industry. But that first bill that you're talking about, removing the 25%, it removes the cap altogether. There's not one venue, not one restaurant that's exactly the same. So what we're asking for is follow the guidelines as best as possible, the six feet separation or physical barriers and set up your restaurant to allow you the most you can possibly seat using those, those uh, guidelines. That is the, the, the key for that, that bill to allow restaurants to work in, the, in the, the largest capacity possible. Because remember, profits don't come in the beginning, they come at the end. Are, are you hearing from your constituents who run these businesses that they have enough PPP and they feel that things can run safely? Yes, working with a lot of my restaurant owners, the first thing they say is, we don't want to get anyone sick. We want to keep our staff healthy. We want our patrons to come back another day. How devastating would it be if they knew they were going to have someone get sick? So they want to follow the guidelines, keep everyone healthy as possible, and still have a viable business. Your second bill, which you touched on earlier, uh, would eliminate the rule that alcohol can only be sold if there's a meal alongside of it. Is, is that really one of the key issues that you're hearing from your constituents? Oh, absolutely. If you work with any of the bars or taverns, and you yourself probably know this as well, some of the biggest profit centers in your restaurant is the alcohol sales. And especially after dinner, there are people come in and gather for a, a drink and conversation. Well, that has ended with this order. So we're asking to bring that back and allow seating at the bar, but in uh, smaller units with physical space or barriers. 
And again, one of my restaurants just had the LCE agents in, the Liquor Control Enforcement. They came in and said, you have a wonderful setup here. This should be no reason. In fact, it's actually safer to have dinner at the bar than would be sitting at a table across from each other. So they, they were very happy with that. So I know that can work. And that's the, the basis of that, that part of the bill. Your third bill would allow eateries to expand their outdoor seating uh, to areas around the business within 250 feet. Uh, how does that really affect the bottom line for these businesses? Well, as, as uh, most restaurateurs are entrepreneurs, they're finding ways to still make their business viable in all these restrictions. So a lot of them put outdoor tents up and working in uh, uh, their parking lots and other areas. But what we're finding is the licensed area isn't large enough. And they have other spaces, but they're not contiguous. This bill allows that non-continuous space to be used within 250 feet. Now, I guess one question that I would have is, you know, with winter approaching, how viable is that going to be for the business model moving forward? Exactly. In one of the meetings yesterday I was brought up is, yes, it's working fine in the summertime. Fall's coming. What are we going to do if we can't have more than 25% indoors? We are all going to have to shut down. So uh, this non-continuous continuous space is essential in this time frame. But boy, when we get into winter, we have to make sure we're uh, opening up the rest of the indoor facilities. The fourth issue, which kind of ties into how you keep the businesses afloat moving into a, its worse economic time, is uh, you want to waive the license and renewal fees for these bars and restaurants for this year. Uh, yes. How big of a boon is that? It's about a thirteen million or thirty-two million dollar savings for our industry across the state of Pennsylvania. That's about what the total would be. But can you imagine being restricted and not allowing to use the license you have already paid for, and then you get to renewal to pay for it again, but yet you're not yet allowed to use it? So it's a double whammy because you're not generating any revenue to cover. Uh, this is just what? Another, another way to give some relief to those business owners. On a per business basis, how much money does that end up being? Oh, uh, average is around seven hundred and fifty dollars to twelve hundred dollars, depending on the size of the location. I don't have any specific numbers, but um, I'm hearing it from oh, so many of the club owners and the bar owners, restaurant owners. That it's just another hit when they are so lacking in funds. Well, for those of us on the other side of, of the bar who have been having difficulties getting into these bars and restaurants and having a normal life. Uh, what, what ways can we support our local businesses and restaurants? Well, that's why I try to encourage people. If you're comfortable, please go to your local bars and restaurants. These are your, your local neighbors and friends who are supporting all the nonprofits in your area to go as often as you can. And, uh, encourage your friends and family to go, especially when they're still under these restrictions and can get this uh, legislation through. Um, th this is a backbone of, um, of Pennsylvania, small businesses and restaurants in 2018 provided $24 billion in economic stimulus throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, the, uh, in, the independent fiscal office offered some uh, information recently about what the issues facing food service workers and one of the things that they stated that really caught my eye was 134,000 food service workers have lost their jobs so far this year. And we're looking at the potential of permanent business closures. How dire is the situation? Well, 10% of all of Pennsylvania's uh, were Pennsylvanians were employed by restaurants in 2018, 10%. You're, you're looking at, according to the house majority, uh, uh, hearing that they had, the policy committee had a hearing, they anticipate 175,000 jobs permanently lost if we don't get some uh, relief to this industry. Is there any way that uh, our viewers can reach out to our legislators and help get the, these bills moving through uh, Harrisburg? Yes, I would encourage everyone to make sure they reach out to their elected officials. I anticipate these bills to be primed and ready to move in early September when we're coming back into session. And I am 
quite certain they'll be uh, moving through the committee very easily. It should move through the Senate very quickly. The pressure is going to be on the uh, governor's office when it's time for them to come in front of him and be signed into law. That's when we're going to need lots of pressure. And I know the organizations that I talked about, the PRLA, the Tavern Association, they're going to be talking to all their members. They're going to do a lot of campaigns. And I'm asking everyone to please call. Write your letters well, and the emails. Well, my guest today has been Senator Pat Stefano. He represents Fayette, Somerset, and Westmoreland counties. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And let's go out and have some dinner and drinks tonight. Thank you. The eyes of the nation are on Pennsylvania as a key influencer to the 2020 election. PCN has over 25 years of trusted state government coverage. Our network is your platform to connect directly with Pennsylvania voters. Whether it's a presidential race, statewide campaign, or local cause, our viewers are ready to hear from you. Book your ad now. PCN, your access to Pennsylvania voters. My guests today are Democratic Representatives Kruger and Schusterman. Uh, you both are introducing a bill regarding nonprofits and what they need to survive COVID uh, as a result of everything that's happened. So, uh, Representative Schusterman, could you tell us a little bit about what your bill does? Uh, thank you very much for having us both here. Uh, Representative Kruger and my bill basically alleviates the financial pain for nonprofits. They need our help. Unlike restaurants and hair salons and businesses, they don't always have, uh, you know, a, a front door that's showing people that they aren't receiving federal and state funding currently. And our fund fills in that need so that they can survive during COVID. No one anticipate, anticipated that COVID would go this long. And um, they're unable to raise the money they normally would raise during their fundraising seasons. And these are grants that they can use to survive. Representative Kruger, are, uh, is fundraising the only mechanism that nonprofits use to generate revenue? Well, so before I was in the legislature, I was a nonprofit executive director. So I've got some firsthand experience with this. This is also why this bill, um, House Bill 2739, is so near and dear to my heart, because I've heard uh, firsthand from nonprofit leaders here in Delaware County and across the Commonwealth about the challenges they're facing. And I've been in their shoes, you know, certainly not during a pandemic, but I know the financial challenges of running a nonprofit organization. So nonprofits have all different kinds of revenue sources. You know, some of them, it's uh, grants, whether government grants or philanthropic grants. Some of them raise money from individual donors. Some of them have earned revenue where they have a service that they're able to sell as a fees for service. But no matter what the funding streams are, you know, I've heard from nonprofit organizations across the board that they have been dramatically impacted. Even nonprofits that have um, you know, fairly large budgets or have a fee for service program may not be able to charge the same fees that they did before COVID because their client base is suffering. And, uh, Representative Schusterman and I are hearing from people every day who are having a hard time paying their bills. And so nonprofits are, are really, really struggling in this economic environment. Now, when we talk about nonprofits, you know, you're giving some examples of people who help with bills and, and you know, other advocacy organizations. Uh, but Representative Schusterman, uh, there are nonprofits come in all shape and sizes. What about organizations such as uh, the, the Elks? Are, are they eligible for this bill? Well, that's a great question. Um, it, it's definitely, we would like all nonprofits to apply. And like if you mentioned, nonprofits run the gamut from our food banks to the YMCA. There are historical nonprofits. So we, we built the bill in order for everyone to go ahead and apply. But what, what we're finding with our current relief, our grant system for small uh, mom and pop shops and um, middle-sized businesses, there might be a need for another round of funding for the nonprofits because not only are the people coming to them in more need, there are more people coming to them every day. So for our viewers' knowledge, how much would these grants be worth? 
So um, our bill, House Bill 2739, would allocate $100 million total of the remaining CARES Act funding to nonprofit grants. Um, and this is specifically for 501c3 nonprofits. There's other nonprofits that are more membership-based organizations. 501c3s, though, are the ones that we think about who help with food relief or energy relief or um, help low-income kids or you know, are helping uh, survivors of domestic violence. Those are typically organized as 501c3 organizations. They have a charitable purpose by law. And so this $100 million grant fund is restricted for those purposes. Now, Representative Kruger, what are some of these requirements that are attached to the bill? What do these nonprofits have to prove to get the funding? So it's pretty broad. Um, there are other pieces of legislation circulating in Harrisburg right now that are more restrictive that would only fund certain kinds of nonprofits. But in, in the midst of a pandemic and this economic downturn, we want it to be as wide as possible. And so this legislation intentionally does not choose between what kind of nonprofits, because all of them are struggling right now. And I believe that all of our nonprofits provide really important services to people here in Virginia. Now, Representative Schusterman, within the bill, it says specifically that these are related to costs related to COVID and the pandemic more broadly. Can you give us some examples of what those might look like? Well, the most obvious are hand sanitizer and masks. Um, I've uh, helped within my district to hand out food, and it is really amazing how many masks you go through and how many times you're, you're taking care of your hands or you're cleaning services. So those are some of the most obvious. Uh, with other nonprofits where they're maybe doing some socially distanced but face-to-face -face counseling, plexiglass, you know, different initiatives like that in this new world of COVID. Representative Kruger, does that sound right? Are there other uh, things that might be adding to the cost? You know, I, I think you know, there's certain nonprofits that have had to add cleaning services, right? Or they've had to redo their space requirements in order to accommodate social distancing. Um, programs that serve kids or seniors, for example, and are able to serve them within the current um, guidelines for public health. But maybe they have need to rearrange their space. They've got new desk requirements. They've got new furniture requirements. Um, so I think, you know, Nonprofits tend to be a creative and um, sort of scrappy bunch. Uh, nonprofit leaders are some of the most innovative folks. They're social entrepreneurs, right? They've got entrepreneurial skills. They just happen to be running an uh, organization that can't legally make a profit that they would keep themselves. But they've got some, some of that same energy that drives the entrepreneurial spirit here in Pennsylvania. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what they come back with. We're, we really would like to get this program funded. Um, there's still a billion dollars or so of worth of CARES Act dollars that haven't been appropriated. The legislature has enacted legislation to help hospitals, to help volunteer fire companies, to, you know, $225 million to help our small businesses. All of those things are important, but we still haven't done enough to help the nonprofit community. Representative Schusterman, Within the bill, it specifically states that the window for uh, getting these claims for the, the funding, it, the window is between early March and the end of September. As we move into winter, there are concerns about what the pandemic continues to look like. What do you say to the businesses that are still in the process of trying to patch these holes? I'm sorry, the very end of your question? I'd say the, the, these nonprofits that are trying to continue to patch holes and that will likely continue to be doing so, uh, what kind of window, how, how can you help them as they continue past the deadline? Well, that's why I keep talking about different rounds and different ways to help nonprofits. This bill is specifically for money to absorb the costs that they uh, are handling currently with um, COVID and you know, cleaning their office and providing a different creative way of dealing with their business. But as we move on, we're going to have to offer all businesses and nonprofits um, that are in need some other solutions. Uh, Representative Kruger, what kind of solutions could we be looking at as we get further into the, a legislative session that begins in just a few weeks? Well, um, the speaker just announced that we're coming back on September 1st. So we'll be back in Harrisburg um, earlier than we had expected. Um, this bill was referred to the Appropriations Committee back in July. So 
Um, we would like to see action on it when we come back in September. And you know, you referred to the, the timing. This is a bill we were working on at the beginning of the summer. If we're not able to get it voted on soon, there's always the opportunity to amend the bill to make the timeline longer. Um, and so that's something we're certainly open to doing. And for our viewers at home, at home who may be attached to nonprofits or you know, have a, a lot of love for them in their hearts, what are some things that, that they can do to, to help you guys pass this bill? Well, if you think about it, there are over 770,000 nonprofit employees. I think they need to make some noise and write to their legislator to sign on to the bill and to really put the pressure for us to, you know, this is a solution. This is a way to help people get back to work safely, to continue keeping their services open and available. And um, that requires, we can't protest at this point in uh, the Capitol, but we can write to um, our legislators and our senators about this bill. Well, that's all the time that I have today. Representatives Kruger and Schusterman who are sponsoring a bill to help nonprofits. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for inviting us to join you today. Thank you. Keystone Cuisine takes you across Pennsylvania to dine at award-winning eateries and neighborhood treasures. Peek inside the kitchens of the taverns that fuel the revolution. Explore Pennsylvania restaurants you never knew existed, serving stories waiting to be told. Keystone Cuisine, at the center of Pennsylvania's table, Sunday nights at 9. PCN, Pennsylvania History and Culture. My guest today is Daniil Girardi Myers, who is the president of the Pennsylvania School Bus Association. Daniil, as we move into a uh, new school year, we're, we're seeing a lot of talk about how schools do distancing, how they prepare themselves. How are school bus drivers preparing for the school year? Well, Morgan, basically the way that we're preparing for the school year is just ensuring that um, the sanitization is really strong on the buses. Uh, we're ensuring that we're taking care of those high point, those high touch areas. Uh, for instance, the handrails coming onto the bus, the high back seats touching where the students are going to be touching there. And um, just truly making sure that the uh, communities realize that um, we take so much pride in our buses and the cleanliness has always been a uh, a sense of concern for that safety, but just taking it to another level. So some of us will be actually um, doing uh, spraying the buses with some different disinfect disinfectant um, cleaner throughout um, the course of the day. Um, it, it truly really depends on what you and your school district have determined uh, is part of that safety and health plan. Um, so you're going to see a little bit of variation throughout the state because one size isn't going to fit all. Now, before we get too far, much further into the logistics of how, you know, we sanitize buses and everything, the, the industry has, uh, is kind of shrouded in mystery. Not a lot of people really know uh, what happens on a school bus when they're out of school. So can you tell us a little bit about what's been happening with school buses? Uh, throughout, while we haven't been in session, uh, most of your school buses are clean throughout the summers. Um, that's just a normal routine uh, that does happen in the industry. So, you know, right now the sanitization on those buses is, they're ready to go. Um, that's the one thing we've been trying to do for the state of Pennsylvania is just ensuring that, um, you know what, we are operationally ready. Uh, the buses are cleaned. We have our teams in place and, um, you know, let's get our students back on to the safest form of transportation. How many kids in Pennsylvania ride the bus? Um, we actually have 1.5 million students that ride the bus in the state of Pennsylvania and about 300,000 of those students are exceptional learners. What is an exceptional learner? Your exceptional learners are um, a kind of a new term there for your special needs communities. Uh, so our students with their autism, our Down syndrome students, um, just our students that need a little extra assistance um, in the school system. So we have all these kids that are trying to get to school. Who are the kids, or sorry, 
who are the uh, professionals who are bringing these kids to school? Well, those professional school bus drivers, that's, that's who's bringing them to school. Uh, and we are proud to say that, uh, you know, we have over 300 school bus contractors and that represents about 10,000 vehicles uh, across the, you know, the, uh, our members represent a fleet of over 10,000 vehicles. And so we have just such passionate professionals. Um, you know, they, the training that a school bus driver goes through is absolutely amazing. And it takes us approximately eight to 12 weeks to put a school bus driver behind the wheel of a bus. And so that's why it's really important um, that we are trying to get our message out there that we need to maintain our pro professional drivers right now. Uh, because uh, it's not something when the schools decide to come back into session that we will we have our workforce we're not sure um, but yes definitely a school bus driver is uh you know they're an essential employee that is uh you know when we we say professional not only does it take us those 12 weeks but every four years a school bus driver recertifies um, and during that recertification they spend um, seven hours within the classroom and then it's a minimum of three hours out there behind the wheel just showing that what their skills are and that they're staying on top of those skills. What are the demographics of a bus driver? Uh, you know the demographics it does vary. Uh, we find that we have a lot of our um, retirees uh, that want that reason to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, they still want to work, but maybe not have that full-time job. So um, it varies there. You have possibly the mom who is um, looking for something in between the, the day when her student's at school. Um, or it could be, you know, just that young, the young student who has a love for driving. Um, but of course, they all better have a love for students. Uh, pretty important there. Well, with the, the demographics in mind, we have some retirees, you know, what kind of anxiety or, or, or stresses that have been cropping up among the members of your association? Or is, is that been a problem? Oh, I think it's a kind of across the board is just making sure that we're providing those PPP items that our team members are going to need. Um, our safety teams, we need to ensure that we have masks available for them. We know that's now a requirement throughout the state. Um, so our drivers will be having some type of face covering is what I'll say is because each one of them needs to determine what what is that item going to be for them. Is it going to be the mask? Is it going to be the shield? Um, you know, what are they comfortable with? Do they wear glasses? Do they need to ensure that um, while they're out there behind the wheel that they're able to see um, and, their, and their glasses aren't fogging up is what I'm trying to share there. So um, a lot of dry runs sh are going to happen. So, we, you know, we've kind of covered that. Um, the hand sanitizer is something that has started to become a little bit of a spark as to whether we should have that on the bus or whether we not we shouldn't um our company here in northwestern pennsylvania we've always had hand sanitizer on our buses um just something more that we can use for sanitization um hand wipes hand wipes are a really good item to use also lysol lysol um great items so i mean it's just really ensuring that our safety teams have all the necessary items that they need they're excited they've missed the kids they've missed their their students um you know some of them are sad they didn't get to say goodbye to their to their graduates um, because they really do build an uh quite a interesting relationship with the students um and they, and a love i should say for the students also now, every bus route is different, obviously, but you know, how packed can these buses be? Or is there limits on the number of kids on a bus? Well, that's going to depend on the school district and the contractor. Um, you know, as contractors, we've tried to really sit down with our school districts and be a part of their safety plans. Uh, so that will vary. And why I say that varies, there are some school districts that are saying, absolutely, it'll be one student every six feet. Well, if you do that on a 72 passenger bus, you're looking at around nine students that can actually ride that bus. Um, is that realistic in a lot of our rural areas? Not really. 
Um, in our school district, we've taken the approach that we're going to use um, the American Pediatrics recommendation of three to six feet. Now, the three, to, the three feet works really well with a mask. And so that's what we're going to be able to do is two students to a seat with the mask. And so we're kind of following more of a three foot distance. Um, I've read articles where some of the school districts are going to skip that first row seat. Um, so that gives a little more area around your, your safety team member, your school bus driver, and then load from there. Um, some school districts may decide to have the students come on and you load from the back to the front. Um, it really depends on whether you're a, a triple tiered area where you're running into maybe the elementary, then the middle school, then the high school, or whether you're K through 12. And so that's why we say one size isn't going to fit across the state and everyone just needs to make sure that they're comfortable with the decision that has been made for their school district. Now, some of our viewers in Philadelphia may know that you know, SEPTA has added barriers between the driver and the, and the passengers. Is something like that logistically feasible on buses? Um, it depends on your state. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, no. Um, PennDOT has looked at that with us. Uh, we are one of the, the most regulated states when it comes to school bus transportation. And our, we have strong uh, what's called the Chapter 171 regulations. And so those barriers do not fit into the regulations in the state of Pennsylvania. I was on a call recently and I know that the state of Illinois, I believe it was Illinois, is going to have a type of a barrier around um, that driver. Uh, but no, here in the state of PA, uh, we're not, it's not really a recommendation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that have gone into that is, you know, is it the material going to allow the driver to get in and out of the seat quickly in case of an emergency needing to evacuate that the bus? Um, you know, is there going to be a glare there that um, is coming off that shield that would cause um, some vision problems? So, yes, in our state of PA right now, that is not a recommendation. Well, that's all the time we have. My guest has been Daniil Girardi Myers, who is the president of the Pennsylvania School Bus Association. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Morgan. PCN is committed to keeping Pennsylvanians informed through this difficult time.